Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Oscar Garcia, and today I want to talk to you about uh, data engineering process fundamentals. Uh, we are going to be building a cloud-based data pipeline from this concept using uh, a data source or CSV file into a visualization uh, solution where we can actually look at the data and understand what the data is telling us. But to get started, let's understand a little bit more about what is a data engineering process. Uh, the diagram you see there is a brainstorm um, visualization that enables us to see what the process may look like. Um, a data engineering process is just really a series of steps that if we execute properly, we're able to, it enables us to, um, to understand the problem statement. So we know what we're trying to solve, understand the scope of work, I'll be able to define the design and architecture of our solutions so we can support big data use cases uh, for analytical and visualization purposes. Um, data engineering process really has a few, a few phases. Uh, we start with the discovery phase where we actually get into understanding what we're trying to do. What is the problem statement and what are we trying to solve? Um, then we will move on into design and infrastructure planning, which is really that uh, where we talk about now that we understand this, what we're trying to build, um, how we're going to run it, how are we going to support this, what's the infrastructure requirements to, to be able to build this solution. Um, then we move on into pipeline and orchestration. We talk about what is a data pipeline and what is orchestration. That's really when we start getting very uh, detailed into the implementation effort uh, and the DevOps uh, efforts of the process. Uh, we then move on into a data warehouse where we talk about the difference between the design and implementation, where we actually now, once we have the data available to us, um, what are the next steps to be able to model the data? What is, what's the schema model that we need to use? What are the um, data implementations or database uh, optimizations requirements that we need? Uh, and after we complete the data flow, the data pipeline into our data warehouse, now we start looking at data analysis and visualization. And we talk about what is the difference between the two, um, how, how can we go about to do the analysis, and when or what is data visualization. Today, we are going to be covering a lot of details, a lot of information. So um, do not worry about keeping notes. Uh, and there is a GitHub project that you have access to. Uh, just Google, um, I'm sorry, go to GitHub and find my name, O-Z-E-K-A-R-Y, or just for, um, look for um, Data Engineering MTA, and you'll be able to pull that project. Uh, I'll quickly switch to that so you're able to see. Uh, but the project really what it does it enables us to uh, document everything that we are talking about today it provides to you some links um, in, in a summary of what we're trying to talk about today so it starts with the problem statement uh, we define our analytical approach um, our data analysis criteria the result of building the, the, the dashboard the visualization and to interpret what the conclusions of that analysis is uh, of course uh, we also need to define the design and the architecture to be able to follow this process. So what we're trying to do really is follow a mature process that <clears throat> is going to enable us to build the solution and that we can actually support it, right? So we've got to think about DevOps and cloud engineering in addition to data engineering processes. So now that we understand... Um, the process overview, let's get a little bit of a background, right? So we're going to be using a data set from uh, from the city of New York um, subway system. Um, basically, the way this works is this data comes from, the, um, it tracks the number of, uh, of people that are traveling in the subway system. So every station is equipped with gates or turnstiles. And as people are arriving into the station, they enter a subway station, this is really a departure. So they're really getting into the subway station to travel to somewhere. And when they exit a station, this is a, an arrival. So they're really just, they arrive to a particular location. So they're exiting that location. So it's very important for our analysis 
for our analysis to be able to understand that difference, right? So, uh, so we're going to be using this this information from the MTA system, uh, which makes it makes the data available to us through, <coughs> excuse me, CSV files, All right? And um, if you're not familiar with the city of New York, but the, the the amount of traffic there in the subway system is huge. They get millions of people every hour in an hourly basis. So imagine if you were to cover 10 hours, 12 hours of traffic, we're talking about massive amounts of data. So now that we have a little bit of background, let's talk about the discovery process. What is the discovery process and why is it needed? In the discovery process for a data engineering process, uh, we need to kind of identify the problem statement and we need to clearly document what we're trying to do and how we're going to solve this problem statement right so we need to talk about understanding what the data looks like understanding the structure the frequency of that data what is it that the, the business needs to resolve uh, by using this information so the discovery process enable us to do those things <coughs> For analytical purposes, what we do is we sort of download sample files. We run experiments with uh, with those files, whether we write Python scripts or um, using uh, VS Code, or we run some script using Jupyter Notebooks. It really depends on the tools sorry, that we're familiar with um, and how we want to do this. Uh, we can use Pandas for data transformation. We can use Plotly for basically building charts that can help us understand the data a little bit more, more, a little bit better. But the end goal is to be able to document the requirements, understand what we're trying to do. A problem statement is very key here. Um, <clears throat> it basically tells us, gives us a roadmap of what we're trying to solve, right? So basically um, the problem statement is that in the city of New York, there are businesses that are uh, close to these uh, subway stations and they would like to target um, consumers um, by using a sort of a geofence or a virtual boundary around their location. So imagine all these people arriving and, and they're parting from these train stations at a particular day, a particular hour. Um, they, these businesses want to be able to know what are the peak hours, what is the frequency of, of all these uh, commuters, so it can actually target them <clears throat> with some messaging on their phones. And that's where the geofence technology really kicks in, where we actually our phones are being tracked and they can actually target users that are close to their businesses. Um, when we switch back to um, to the GitHub repo, then uh, if we actually go and look at the discovery process, <coughs> this is the area where we actually do our um, we, do the hands-on analysis, right? So we start, we, we read the problem statement already. We understand basically what, what's happening, what is it we need to solve. So now we need to start getting familiar with how we solve it. So for that, we have, uh, we need to look at the data. We need to download sample data and do some analysis on it. This is where we actually download the data. We do some queries. Uh, we do some observations of the data. We notice the data is available, maybe perhaps in, in weekly batches. Uh, we see the data is basically partitioned on four hours intervals, right? The audit the data in four hours intervals. And this makes sense because it's a huge amount of data. So in those four hours intervals, they get millions of records, right? So, uh, and basically we identify what are the dimensions out of this, this, this data? How is the date and time defined? How, what does the structure look like? what are the measures that we need to track like entries and exits right and this is where we actually go about to do our data dictionary we catalog everything that's there so we understand so we're writing this, uh, we're writing requirements we're defining specification we start getting an idea of what we're actually trying to do we start writing conclusions of the things that we're going to have to do downstream when we start building our data pipeline so we're able to solve this so it's a very key and important um phase of the project where we actually now come up with the requirements to understand what are the um, <coughs> infrastructure requirements that are ne needed to hold this technology, to support it, to support operational activities, to maintain it healthy, so to understand that it continues to run. So this is a very important aspect of the process. Uh, if you follow the GitHub project, you will see that there is opportunity for us to uh, give you instruction on how to install dependency, 
uh, and how to manage it, right? Using Jupyter Notebook or using Python. And when it comes to the code, you can actually look at the MTA discovery Py file, which is really a Python file. And by browsing through it, you will see um, you will see the code that enables us to basically go and download um, um, the CSV files and, and chunks of data for optimization uh, and be able to write it and compress it. So we're able to now minimize uh, data storage, right? And this is where we can actually do some more code to do data analysis, or we could just go ahead and use a Jupyter Notebook which is provides us with a more visual interface to be able to document some of the steps and be able to run the same Python query. So we can actually open a file. You can even download a file, but in this case, a file has been downloaded. So I'm just reading it and kind of look at the data, right? Just get a top uh, number of records, um, understand that we need to merge the day and time fields because we probably want, want to do it more effectively that way as opposed to having in separated columns. <coughs> and we start making observations about the entries, the exits, the dimensions for the station. And this is really very helpful because we start building out certain specifications on what we're trying to do and how we want to do it, right? Um, and this is very useful for downstream purposes when we start actually doing the heavy implementation effort. So now that we know, we understand the discovery process, we did data analysis, we know uh, what is, um, how the data is flowing. Now we can move on into the next phase of the project, which is design and planning. <coughs> Excuse me. For design and planning of, uh, of, the, of the data engineering project, it's, it's, the design <coughs> is crucial for uh, laying out the design and planning phase of data engineering project is crucial for laying out the foundation of our system. It really involves defining the system architecture, designing the data pipelines, implementing source control practices so we can have continuous integration, continuous delivery processes, and leveraging, and leveraging tools like Docker and Terraform for running our code. And not only running our code, but actually automating the creation of the infrastructure. Since we want to be able to do a cloud agnostic approach here, we, we we can use Terraform to be able to build the scripts to build all the dependencies, right? The VMs, the data lakes, uh, the data warehouse systems, and any other uh, infrastructure dependencies we may have. We definitely want to use a tool like GitHub for um, managing our, our code repository and our um, CI CD pipelines. Um, and we also want to be able to isolate our environments uh, where we run our code so we can actually create containers to be able to host uh, our code and all the dependencies that are near, needed for our code to execute properly. So a Docker container is a good approach for this. Okay. So how do we go about to do this, right? How do we build this, 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 uh, this infrastructure and how do we, we, we start thinking about uh, the design of our of our process. So for that, we move on to um, to the data engineering design area. This is this is key, right? This is where we start talking about <coughs> system architecture. Um, how are we going to? What do we really need to do, right? Uh, what are the, the the infrastructure requirements for it, right? What kind of tooling do we need? Do we need for this? Um, so all of these are important areas that we need to cover. Data pipeline, when we start defining our data pipeline, what is a data pipeline, right? And how are we gonna execute it? Are we gonna use an, extra, an ETL process like extract, transform, and load? Or are we using a ELT process? I mean, the differences are very subtle, but there, there are differences there. So for example, an ETL might require us to build a lot more Python code to be able to do the transformation, um, which also requires um, for it to run within our containers and our VM instances, right? So it's going to have to allocate more memory for the process. Although we, although we choose to go for an approach where we actually do a lot of this transformation efforts on a data warehouse engine that it may be designed uh, and optimized for that kind of work and where we can use the SQL, um, the power of SQL uh, to be able to do some of, some of this work. So it really depends to evaluate what the approach may be, right? So we have to think about um, 
is um, Python, pro Python process as opposed to SQL process, which one is more optimized for what we're trying to do. But this is where this, is, this type of evaluation is often, uh, often takes place. We have to think about the orchestration, right? So it's not about just building the code. <clears throat> How do we manage it? How do we execute it? How do we deploy it? How do we monitor, right? How do we uh, notify in cases of errors and how do we recover from it? So we need to start thinking about data orchestration tools to be able to help us do that. Source control and deployment. We need to be able to use tools to do this because this is gonna be a repetitive process where we actually make updates or add um, increment, do incremental changes, right? Where we actually do it maybe a new pipeline or new change, a new data, data point that we need to the process so we don't want to be able we want to make this in a way that we can control the source code source control the source code and we're able to monitor and view what's going on and we're able to deploy this test the process in a way that's automated without human interaction right? and once it started uh, it's running we want to isolate the environments use docker containers and use docker hub Do docker hub is a is a um container uh, repo where we actually can push images to it and once we start running the process we can download these images for to um, basically to help us do a continuous delivery type uh, uh, process uh, and definitely use use a tool like terraform to be able to build the cloud in infrastructure is really a cloud agnostic type tool um, which it supports multiple providers whether it's google Azure, AWS, to be able to build those resources. Um, cloud infrastructure planning, right? Where we need to actually now uh, understand what are the resources we need to build, whether it's a VM instance, a data lake, a data warehouse. Um, and then we have to be able to um, execute it. So if you follow this project, you will see how the project is being executed. You will see all the different commands to be able to run it. Um, how do your integration with the, the, the cloud platform when it comes to uh, the credentials that it will enable these tools to be able to talk about, to, to be able to integrate with the cloud platform. And here you will have the, the steps on how to use Terraform, how to initialize a new project, how to do a plan and how to do and how to apply it. And what that really just means is that when you, the, the, the Terraform development life cycle really is that as we, we code the, the, the resources we need to build, we can execute a plan. If it's the first time that it's being executed, um, the plan will say, I need to build all these things. If it is a delta change, the plan will say, um, I'm, a, I'm about to make this change. So so someone will review that and approve it. And, they, and when we apply that change, it is actually deploying it into the infrastructure. So it's a very delicate process once you're in production mode because you don't want to be applying things that may break production. So it's very important. And of course, this can be run through the command line as well as GitHub Actions, where we can actually execute our um, Terraform scripts and be able to automate the process, right? So the way you see that now is um, in the GitHub repo, we can go into a Terraform and look at two files here. Um, we'll see a variables file that what it does, it provides all the all the configuration look uh, information, right? Like what region, what kind of storage do we want? What, what kind of uh, data warehouse do we want? And we start defining some of those dependencies, right? What kind of VM image we want? Um, and this is just giving us the instructions for what kind of resources uh, we need in those variables. Um, but the, the, the main file really is what executes the, the process, right? It actually, defines the resource allocation and it uses the variables to be able to get to understand what it needs to build. It uses um, environment variables uh, to kind of keep those secrets hidden from, from any kind of uh, for people, uh, DevOps uh, or, or engineers. So because those, those are areas that should be more towards the data governance and security where we don't want to really be showing those kind of secrets. So everything is really hidden in the system through a vault system and it's just passed through the process via environment variables. Uh, but this is really the file that will build out this infrastructure and you can read a little bit more as you um, just you go to the project and you can execute it. But going back, those files are really just um, <coughs> 
executed through the uh, through the uh, uh, through the terminal window, and you can just use the Terra, Terraform uh, CLI to be able to build it and use it. Okay, so this, in this step of the process, now we we basically build out the resources. We have the infrastructure. Uh, and so now we need to start moving on. Now that we know where to host our pipeline, well, now we need to start moving on into the implementation effort over over pipelines. All right. So now we are into the data pipeline and orchestration, right? So we have our infrastructure set up. We use Terraform to build out our VM, uh, to build out our data lake. So now we need to start thinking about how we're going to build out our pipeline. Right? And what is a pipeline? Pipeline is really just a workflow that executes um, uh, a few tasks to to accomplish a specific uh, unit of work, right? And they can be executed in Docker containers so we can isolate that is dependencies. The, and but the actual execution and scheduling, managing, and monitoring of this pipeline is what we refer to as an as orchestration. So the pipelines really is the actual code that runs, it gets executed, the workflow that gets executed, but who manages this is really the orchestration, which is really important for the efforts of uh, DevOps uh, and be able to monitor the process, be able to recover from problems, right? So we need to worry about operational uh, concerns, right? And be able to support this. So for us to execute this, uh, we, we require for the VM and data lake resources to be already uh, uh, built through our Terraform uh, process. So after we know that that's been done, we need to start making decisions. How we want to build this pipeline? Do we use a co-centric and we use a language like Python to do this? Uh, or do we use a low code approach and we use something like Azure Data Factory to do this? Right? Uh, it really depends on the team, on the expertise of the team and the resources that you have. In our case, uh, since we're looking more at data engineering process, we're gonna we're gonna do a co-centric approach. But it's important to know that tools like Azure Data Factory, which is a black box, it actually is doing something very similar behind the scene. Behind the scenes, it's just optimized and it's packaged very well. So for us, it's really more of a configuration. But it, it, it in fact does some of the efforts that you that, that we're doing through code, right? Uh, we definitely, uh, what's very important, whether we use co-centric or low-code, is that we need to have supporting services to be able to track the telemetry information so we can uh, we can manage our components, our deployments, uh, dashboards to see the health and the performance of the processes, and then be able to uh, orchestrate the, sch the schedule, the, the run times, and be able to monitor that everything is working fine. When it comes to Docker, uh, Docker Hub and GitHub, <clears throat> GitHub is to store our source code. Docker Hub is really to use the deployment of that image, right? So we're going to put all that source code into our container. We're going to build that image. We're going to um, push it to Docker Hub. And we'll be able to now, when we configure our deployments, we'll be able to say our deployment is located in this Docker Hub image. Please download it and execute it. So let's take a look at and see how that's done. So now, to, in order for us to build a uh, co-centric solution using Python, for example, we need to be able to understand all the um, orchestration requirements, right? And orchestration requirements really are that we need to be able to support scheduling, monitor, capture telemetry data, uh, build charts that enable us to see the performance of our, of our, of our um, pipeline execution, right? So at this point, we introduce a new system. Um, called Prefect Cloud. It could be anything else. It could be other other libraries and other systems. But Prefect Cloud is a is a, it has a great library for cost-centric pipelines where we can actually use um, Python or, or C Sharp. And we're able to use um, these libraries to manage things uh, like creating workflows and running, executing uh, uh, scheduled tasks, right? And what it does, it actually it automatically connects directly with the Prefect cloud and passes all this metadata and uh, telemetry data to the cloud uh, services to be able to capture all this data, right? And be able for us to manage our, our orchestration pipeline. Our data flow is pretty simple, right? We download the file, we run our pipeline, we, we process the data and we move it into our data lake. 
But all this the stuff that's behind the scenes is capturing telemetry data, performance, measuring uh, how health is our process is all being recorded through the prefect cloud or any other system that you want to use for capturing telemetry information. The idea here is that as we download the files, we move them into a data lake, which is important. So once we start defining the process and we start doing the initial deployment, we need to figure out if we need to do an initial data load uh, based on our requirements. Do we, need, do we need to go back two years uh, worth of data to do this analysis? Or are, are, is the goal is to get more recent data or real-time data for today to be able to do this analysis? So depending on that, you may want to capture uh, one month, six month worth of data. So we can actually some trends, we can actually look at historic trends and be able to make sense of the data. So it's really, that depends, that's part of the analysis, depends on what we're trying to achieve. Um, and of course, part of the orchestration is to kind of do weekly automation, um, be able to schedule jobs and run them weekly. And we have tools in the cloud that enables us to monitor, enables us to gather all this information, schedule the jobs, uh, and be able to, to execute it. And how you run it, right, you follow this guidance here. It tells you how to install dependencies like Docker. It tells you how to run uh, the dependencies for prefix and whatever other libraries are needed, right? How to create a prefix cloud account. So when we run this through the process uh, and we have our credentials for, to, to integrate with that cloud service, we're able to uh, connect to it and pass data to it, right? Uh, so if you look at this block here, it really shows us how to do this through the command line, through the terminal, where we can actually do a login, we can register some of our uh, components, uh, and we can actually run um, some code to be able to build components uh, and to schedule uh, deployments. And, and, and we'll show you a little bit of that now. So <clears throat> important here is to understand how to create a Docker image. Docker image is created, but actually um, logging in into our Docker uh, Docker cloud service, uh, grabbing our code and building an image based on our code, based on, on our code, and push that image to Docker Hub, right? So we can later on uh, use it and then execute that, right? So so this just shows you all the different steps of how do we run this. How do we look at the jobs? How do we use uh, look at all the tasks that have been executed? We can do it through the CLI, or we can actually go to the cloud and build it. And of course, this can be done through a GitHub action, or we can actually automate all this process. But how do we build? What does the pipeline code looks like? And how do we build this Docker container? So if you look at the orchestration folder, you will see that there are flows, blocks, and deployments. Blocks, think of blocks as components components that we build to do a specific uh, unit of work. So for example, we need to be able to authenticate with um, with uh, Google Cloud, for example. You may wanna put a block for the credential management, right? So you can get your, your information from a, a, uh, um, a key vault uh, and get your secrets and be able to get them that way. So those are the components, right? So. <clears throat> Another component is that we want to be able to build that integration with uh, the data lake to be able to upload information. So we'll create another component for that. And that component just really looks like uh, um, a configuration file as well. We're using Python with some definitions where we actually go and we load some credentials and we configure particular functions to be able to do, for example, in this case, the GCS bucket, which is really a data storage in Google Cloud. And we were able to reuse this once we start building our code. But the actual data pipeline is really on the on the ETL web to GCS flow. If you look at the flows folder, that's really where the data pipelines are, are built. And if you just look at the code, it's really um, what it's doing is defining. And if you see so some, some uh, function declarations at the top, and then you see that they're really defining this is flow. And that's important. That's really what wires the code into that framework to be able to say, hey, this is a flow execution. Let me go ahead and, and track the metadata and track performance. So that's really the beauty of being able to wire this with a with a library that enables us to, to look at the telemetry uh, data of our process. 
but this is just really going through and validating some of the tasks, some of the days, because we know this is a weekly batch. Um, we need to just get the data according to those dates, specific days that we need to process. And then it, it, it essentially just goes, downloads the data, process that data and uploads that data to GCS using our components. As you can see here on line uh, 36, you will see it's actually loading using our GCS bucket component, which handles that specific task, right? But th that now our code, as we saw here, there is some, um, there's a flow definition and we call that uh, main flow, right? Um, and this is our main flow definition for that. So keep, Make a note of that because that's important, right? What when when do we get to use that, right? So if we start looking at our um, Docker file, for example, now this how do we build this Docker file? So Docker file really is just sort of a configuration file, right? So <clears throat> where we actually tell it to deploy to build this container with these dependencies, right? So we need Python, we need prefect 2.7, we need Python 3.9. Um, we we copy a Docker requirement file that's gonna enable us to have more dependencies defined. So we first select it from an image, pre-built image, and we're copying some requirements that we need to install. And then we execute the PIP install to run all those requirements that are more towards our dependencies, right? Things we need to do. Uh, and then we also copy the, the flow files into that container. So that is actually moving everything that we have into that, um, into the, into that into that container and this is i mean this is a file that we can run through the cli or you can build it through a github uh, action All right so if you look at the deployment definitions now um we're gonna have a docker deployment definition right and this is what what this is really doing is saying i want to create a deployment package that when i run it i know what to execute so if you look at line um 27, right? If you look at that, it's really here is actually saying we're creating a deployment definition, right? And we're using a Docker container image, right? Which what that does, it, it will download it from the key hub, from a, from a uh, Docker's uh, hub, right? And it's saying once I have that image, I need to execute it uh, and I need to run um, this flow main flow. Remember that that entry point that I talked about, it will execute it and it will run it that way. So the magic really happens is we define this deployment and when we run it, when we run it through the commands, as I show you here, right, if you go through all this, um, right, it's going to be able to say, hey, uh, run this, um, you know, go to this deployment, register this deployment, start the uh, agent for the process to schedule and now run this prefect deployment, right? So this deployment definition that is on the cloud is actually saying use this Docker image and use these parameters to execute it. So it will, if it's not, once it's running, if it's not on that VM, the first thing that it will do is download that image and then run it as I show you on that code. So that's really how the magic happens behind the scenes right we have our pipeline code we have our docker image we're pushing to docker hub and we have a, a process that can be repeated often All right so so we're now ready <laughs> we have our pipeline built and is going all the way to data to to data lake so our next step is really on our design phase is um, our next step is really now to work into the data warehouse. so the data is the files are getting added to the data lake um and just to quickly show you data lake, this is really the data lake is really a blob storage uh, and we're actually uploading files here. So it's really is that container for uh, CSV file, compressed CSV files that we have available. So now that data is available there, but we can't really use it, right? The data lake is not optimized to be able to, <coughs> to, to for us to do queries and to do visualization or anything like that. So now we need to move that data into the data warehouse. So how do we do that? So when, when it comes to the data warehouse, we have to think about a couple of areas, right? We need to think about what is the design and what is the implementation of that data warehouse. So in the design phase, we really start thinking about what is the database system, 
right? What engine are we using? Are we using a Redshift? Are we using Azure uh, Synapse? Or are we using, um, in our case, we're using uh, BigQuery, Google BigQuery. Um, but we need to define what that system is. We need to define what is the schema model that we're going to use. Are we going to use start schema? Are we using a snowflake schema? It, it really depends. That's the decision depends on your data, what the data looks like and what you're trying to do with it. What technology stack are we going to be using? Are we, are we going to use our ETL, ELT process, right? How are we gonna how are we gonna do that? We use Python code or can we use SQL code? So really this is the time to make those decisions, right? Um, so once you define the design and the approach, now you go into the implementation phase. And this is really where we start looking at the data models and make them into a fun, convert them into a, a functional system, right? So we have in the design, we define some logical models. But now we re really need to build our physical model. So because that's really where we what we can query, what we can read. So with that, we can actually create um, concrete structures, the concrete structures like dimension tables and fact and fact tables. So we can query that information. So this is the area where we actually look at data transformation tasks, uh, data integration, um, incremental updates, batch loading, right? And we actually uh, process the data so it's optimized for querying and for visualization. So following on that, to do that, the way we, we can do this is uh, on, on data warehouse process, <coughs> uh, we start thinking about what data warehouse engine we're going to use, right? And we already decided that we're going to use um, the data, um, BigQuery uh, data warehouse for this. So now our architecture changes. Right, it, it increments now from data lake to now integration with the data warehouse. Similar to building our data pipeline, it is very important to be able to support uh, DevOps activities, site reliability activities, or operational support. Right, we need to be able to understand that our data is running well, our processes are running well, and that everything is up and running. Right, so. Uh, and since we're building a, a co-centric um, data pipeline approach, then we need to start making decisions about what to use here. There is a another library in cloud service called DBT, a uh, very powerful system. Uh, it does similar to uh, um, to the Python-based uh, library that we talked about. Um, we can actually build data models. We can actually build um, um, table structures um data uh, uh table optimization rules constraints tests and all that using um using a pseudo uh sql sql language right uh which they call jinja right which is a a, a template based type type uh, um structure that we can build this is very similar to sql it just really has a little bit of uh, variation syntax that we can use to make conditional statements. But the idea is that we model the data that way. And when we build it, it generates a SQL and it publishes the SQL into the data warehouse. So it's very important for um, part of the process is to start with the data model. Okay, so now we understand we're using that framework. We, <coughs> What do we need to do next? So we need to start thinking about our data, right? We, we, we got the requirements already though, during our uh, discovery phase and we understand um, what the data looks like. So now we need to start thinking about the models, right? So we need to start thinking about, okay, so we have our data, our data set and it looks like we need to create models for logical models for station, uh, logical models for the booth, uh, logical models for the for the fact tables, right? For the data that we need to measure and and, um, and aggregate. Um, so we need to start thinking about those logical models in the world of DBT. The way that's done is that we actually build the code in such a way that we can uh, <clears throat> we can define those models, build them, and it will create a view behind the scenes. So it actually pushes a view to uh, BigQuery, and we can actually use that <clears throat> we can actually then use this 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 um, logical views enough for that use that as a baseline to create our physical models so now we can create our dimension tables uh in our fact tables based on that and in addition to that we can actually um, define some of the 
uh, optimization rules for partitioning and clustering and also referential integrity for in key constraints and things of that nature. So based on what we understand of the data, we arrive to this um, physical data model, right? Where we create dimension tables for, for the station, for the booth, um, and we create the association to it. And we create a fact table where we can actually create um, the data based on a particular day and time and the station and booth um, associations, right? So this is really our sort of our start schema definition, right? So with that now, we, we sort of understand what we need to achieve and how we need to build it. So um, and in addition, we need to understand optimization rules, right? How to partition the data. And since we, we start understanding that uh, customers are probably going to be looking at the data based on a daytime. We know that it will be best for us to partition that based on the daytime field. And because the second layer of filtering would probably be their location, which is driven by based on the uh, station name, they'll probably want to cluster that um, based on that station name. So this enables us to optimize the queries and minimize the amount of data. In cloud, for cloud data, cloud system, uh, data warehouse, um, there is costs associated with the amount of data that you fetch from a, from a data warehouse, right? So by, by partitioning and clustering the data in such a way, we sort of target specific areas and we minimize the amount of compute and the amount of data that gets fetched from the data warehouse. So this makes it more efficient when it comes to cost, which is very important uh, to, to keep in mind. All right, um, and how to run it? How do we run this file? It's the same way we can look at the different uh, models um, and execute it. We're gonna take a look at the model. So, but let's quickly just review that. If you look at the DBT folder structure here in GitHub, you will see this structure, right? You will see models, you will see core, staging, and target. So staging is really your views, right? So this is where we define the views. These are your logical model, how we think the data should look like. Core is really your physical, um, your physical tables now. So it is really creating the dimension tables and the fact tables based on those logical models. And target really is uh, is more of a um, uh, internal folder for the sake of actually looking at what that that SQL looks like once you build it, because the actual code doesn't look the same as pure SQL. Um, but after it's built, you will see the pure SQL statements there. Um, what's important here is this uh, this process, the lineage process, which is really what tells us what we're going to do, right? So if you remember, in the data lake, we already have our files there. So a lot of the systems, they can use external uh, storage and bring that information as an external table. So we can use that blob storage as an external and bring all the CSV files and create a virtual table for it or external table. And this is what we can process to generate, extract the station name from it, create a, a virtual, um, a logical model for it, define a physical identifier for each unique station name and build our dimension table. We do the same for the booth. And then we extract the measures um, in the associations to the dimension tables uh, in the booth to be able to build the fact table. And the lineage basically gives you that, shows you that flow and that relationship. Um, when you start looking at DBT commands, it's same, there's a CLI for it, uh, where we can actually initialize a project, um, install certain dependencies, uh, and link it to the cloud, DBT cloud, because we need to record, we need to actually track all this um, build process, because this is also follows a DevOps life cycle. In the DevOps life cycle, we need to uh, make changes to, to our code, build them out, uh, make sure everything is good, test them out, test the constraint, test the relationships, and then push it to the production environment. And the way that's done, right, is you, you follow some of these commands like dbt build and, and build this, this model, and we can you can pass a flag to say, do a test run or not, uh, and then build the, the physical models. But essentially what it will do <coughs> is generate all the SQL code and run it. In addition to that, we can do DVT debug, DVT test, which really it's doing 
the process to do this. And all this could be done through a GitHub pipeline, right? Um, so as we do this, it builds all of this out and it actually processes and runs all this. <clears throat> and the way where this is executed, it really depends on how we want to do it. If you look at our diagrams, um, DVT cloud service enables, it actually provides a hook into GitHub where we can actually push from GitHub into a DVT um, uh, space or VM and they can execute it there. That's one way, or we can bring it into our VM. So it really depends on how you want to do it. But the, 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 the important concept here is that this is a process that we can continue to support, continue to run, um, and be able to test and verify before we deploy. The other beautiful uh, area about this is that it handles our documentation. Uh, we can base by building our models, we can actually build our documentation and it will tell us all the assets that it gets generated. It, tell, it can tell us how much data is allocated on each asset because it will do a live connection and actually query our data warehouse. It will give you the lineage. All these are things that are very important for data governance purposes, right? We'll be able, when you get audited on this, they want to see all this information, what's happening behind the scenes. And you can use a framework like this to be able to do that. Right, you can schedule the jobs as part of a pipeline. You can validate it, um, and you can manage your data policies for archiving and things of that nature. But how is this done, really? So, if we look at the DVT projects here, let's look at the areas of importance. Is really uh, the models, right? As you as you noticed on the previously, you have the staging, you have the core. In the staging, for example, let's look at the let's look at the station. Uh, staging file so in reality here what we're saying is that <clears throat> we want to materialize this model and if you notice it's kind of a sql like with just a few tags here and there that are not sql right which is the jinja type uh, uh scripting uh we're saying we want to materialize this as a view and we want to use an external table to get our data right um and then we want to just run it and if it is a test we just want to limit for 100 if not we want to do more right so this is really what it does and then when we do that dvt a uh, build it actually creates the actual uh sql and it pushes that to the database and we'll, sh we'll show you that too uh, but when it comes to the physical model now is we look at the at the dimension the station dimension and then now we can see that this is a, a incremental uh strategy right so what that means is that hey this table is going to increment as we process other csv files we may end up finding other new, new stations or new new data points right so especially in the fact table that data will continue to to grow to increment as they go, days go by we'll have more data points for the new for tomorrow the day after tomorrow and so on right so this 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 strategy of incremental strategy is important and what it really will do it will just kind of design sort of a query but behind the scenes is really generating uh, the all the sql statements to build a table and to create temporary tables and actually go and do this incremental strategy strategy where it's actually saying i want to pick up all the data that doesn't exist based on this rule right and as you can see here for the dimension table for station for the dimension station table we can actually look at anything that doesn't exist in my table capture that. And if we look at the, the fact table, it's a little more elaborate because now we need to actually say <clears throat> that we need to do for that we need to do the process for the new record. So we use the the incremental strategy. Uh, by the way, we add the, the optimization rules with partition by daytime uh, with a daily um, uh, granularity and we cluster by a station ID, right? So, but if you look at it, it's very SQL like um, we use common table expressions to be able to query certain criteria, and then we look at the incremental rules to be able to say, hey, look, <coughs> if this record doesn't exist, add it to the table, right? And we use we use here a pattern where we actually use a, a log ID, and that log ID represents the uniqueness of that entry, right? And it involves a series of, of, of uh, data points, and you will see that um, on, the, um, on the logical model for the for the for the fact table you will see how we create basically uh we generate a particular key 
for a particular reference and create it. So references really is a combination of certain data points, like for example, the the station, the uh, the the uh, I'm sorry, not the station, but the actual booth where they go through in the day and time, right? So whatever whatever makes that record unique, but we create we create a surrogate key um, that enables us to know that that is a unique for that particular station, day and time, and so on. The way that looks once it's generated uh, and it runs is actually, um, well, this is a big query basically, uh, it enables us to create a database for this data and where we can actually have our physical tables, our views, which is really generated from, from, that, from that DBT project. And when I can actually query the data, right? And we can see the results that sets here um, as we run this. We can execute it and it will just go and run all of this. And you know, you can see how much data is being processed, whether it's actually caching some of this data, whether it's um is is if it's so if you notice it's kind of caching uh in the job information, it's sort of caching data and it says that there's no cause because I ran this before, so it's already caching some of that data. But you can see that the fact table has over two million rows, um, and it's just giving us that level of information, right? But this is really what BigQuery look BigQuery looks like behind the scenes. So now we have our data in our data warehouse. Everything is flowing. Our data pipelines are executing. Our development, our DevOps team is happy. Good data governance is flowing. Everything is going there. Now we're ready, right? Our data warehouse is optimized. It's full of data. Now we go into the phase where we actually need to do a data analysis and visualization because we need to answer those questions about um, our problem statement. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is data analysis, right? So data analysis is the practice to, um, to of exploring the data and understanding its meaning, right? This is where we actually look at the data. We query the data. We do some kind of data modeling if you need to, even though we have already done data modeling at the data warehouse level. This is an independent activity because now is the is the is the engineer that's doing the analysis and visualization needs to understand the data models and the data models may be a little bit different, right? They, 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 uh, there may be different rules that exist for him or for, or for her to be able to build and understand. Um, the data, right? So you may create different dimensions and, and measures are very specific, but you may want to see the data differently, right? But this is the process where we actually look and identify problems with the data. Data, even though it's a data warehouse, maybe has some problems. Maybe there's still some issues with it, some some, some uh, false null values, right? Hopefully not, but it can happen. So we need to account for that. We need to identify outliers. We need to look at trends. We need to look at distribution. This is really now where the discovery process, initial data set analysis comes in that, that we actually understood certain areas. So for example, um, if you look at it quickly here in the code, we can define the time slots for this and, the, and do analysis based on time slot, right? Uh, and we can do this using Python or we can use uh, Jupyter notebooks using Pythons or we can use some kind of visualization tool that enables us to do this uh, a little bit more. But usually this is where we, we dig deeper into the data. Visualization, on the other hand, is really where we actually look at the data and visualize it in a way that it is easy for us to see what's going on with the data, right? This is really where business analysts are actually digging into the data. They want to see trends. They want to see uh, distributions. They want to be able to look at it, look at the picture from a high level and be able to understand, aha, my distributions are here, right? This is my top train station. These are my busiest day, day and hours and so on. Um, and this is really where they get deeper into the process of analyzing. This is the, the end result of the analysis. <coughs> and this is the tool that we need to build for them to make decisions. The way we do that, right, to kind of look at this process when it comes to um, the analysis phase is that, <coughs> We start looking at data analysis requirements, right? So we start understanding that um, we may want to break this down in time slot periods, right? Because we don't have hourly trends, right? We don't have, uh, as we notice in the in discovery phase, we discover the data is available every four hours, right? 
we kind of understand requirements for the for the arrivals and departures, right? So we understand and we need to <coughs> understand how to define master filters, uh, secondary filters, right? So for example, daytime, uh, station name, um, and understand what is the data that we need to aggregate on, right? So it's the measures, right? The number of exits, the number of entries, because that is really what enables us to track the information and the traffic and the distributions, right? So, um, so we need to identify um, um, what is the analysis process that we're going to do. So, for example, we can come here and start looking and do some Python scripting to be able to generate this, right? Um, and then we need to do uh, data visualization, which is really now now that we have the analysis, how do we how do we draw that picture, right? How do we make that data talk and tell us really what's going on? That's where we need to make decisions about what kind of uh, components uh, or, or charts to build and how to put it all together, right? So this is very important. So building a dashboard where we actually can put together a few charts that can work together so we can uh, actually read what's happening behind, uh, what, so we can actually understand what the data is telling us. The way to build dashboards, right, you can, same, you, we can do a co-centric approach or we can do a, a Python dashboard, right? I'm sorry, co-centric approach, approach using a Python dashboard. What that does, it actually involves doing a lot of uh, coding, right? A lot of coding. So we can actually build, you know, um, build, uh, install all of our dependencies, um, create all the all the different codes, all the different functions that we need to do, create our pipe charts, create our uh, donut charts, create our bar charts and our filters, and we can do all this implementation. So <clears throat> once, if you look at the code, you will see there's a dashboard Py file, and that actually enables us to build a Python um, dashboard. You can run it, and you can see the amount of effort. So if you drill down into the file, you will see the amount of effort, the amount of code that actually is being used to build this different, uh, right? So th this different uh, feature. So for example, uh, create the donut charts, create the bar charts, create the time slots, right? So where we do all this exercise to do the categories based on day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and we can actually build all of this using this code, right? And basically, uh, we're able to see how to run it through through this, right? But you know, a Python code like that is is an effort. It's an effort. Uh, it also it also involves a lot of DevOps activities to be able to push that code, manage that code, and maintain it. Uh, so we can probably also look at a low code type solution. Uh, and we can look at tools like Power BI, Tableau, Looker Studio, right? So those are tools that enable us to, with the low-code approach, be able to build the solution. And the low-code approach is because we can just write little snippets of code to be able to do certain things. So for example, uh, the time, the timestamp, right, is something that uh, doesn't come out of the box because it's very particular to what we're doing. But we can create a um, computer uh, field that provides that mapping to us by reading that date stamp and saying, okay, if it is between these hours and we understand it's gonna be that time frame, and we can build that stuff that way. Uh, Looker UI is a very powerful local tool, uh, very easy to use. Um, you can um, sign up for it, create an account for it, play with it. Uh, you can create uh, desktop uh, layouts, mobile layouts and so on, but it's just a, a good way to, to build out a tool like that. But at the end of the day, using a low code approach or a co-centric approach really depends on your teams, on budgets, on the resources that you have, uh, the milestones, time to market, many things. In my opinion, uh, low code solutions are faster. Uh, the quality is much better. It's a true enterprise cloud solution. Uh, doing a lot of the code that I, I do a lot of code, I'm telling you, it, it adds a lot of more efforts when it comes to all the operational requirements to be able to support it and not to mention all the code that that's actually already written in many of these low code tools like like uh, like look at the end of the day once we build this dashboards we need to arrive to our data analysis conclusions right so if you go back to our problem statement we're looking at how do we target this 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 consumers right how do we build this uh um, geofence boundaries to be able to target them. So the idea is that with this dashboard, uh, consumers can filter by date uh, and target certain stations. 
and look at the day times and look at what is the best hour range uh, and based on what the season is or what is, if it is a holiday and make all those decisions, right? Uh, and definitely optimize or improve that dashboard um, so that business can make better decisions, right? If we are gonna take a look, uh, this is the live dashboard. I um, mean, as you can see here, it's actually connected to a data warehouse. Here we have a master filter where we can actually select the date, ra date range and filter the data. Uh, and we can select a particular station and filter by, by that data. All these charts here are connected, right? So the master filters control all this data. Uh, and if you drill down into a particular, for example, station, uh, it also it filters all the dashboard. So it actually just focuses it, the focus is on that particular selected station. So all this is interconnected. So you're able to drill down into that station. So you deselect that and it goes back to the entire view. The way this works uh, with the local solution is when you edit this, you can see that all of these are like chart components that you can configure with the dimension, like station name and the metrics, right? So I want the uh, summation of all the distribution by station. In this case, my distribution is I want to track uh, uh, the entries or the exits, right? It really depends on how you do that. Was uh, <clears throat> All of this is really basically a configuration uh, where you get to do a little bit of uh, perhaps a, a customization is, for example, if you look at these charts here where we have 12 to 3, 59 a.m., that's what I kind of indicated to you that we can build a day slot uh, field, which is really a calculated field, so to speak, where we can edit. And we can actually put the snippet of code here and say, hey, <coughs> if the date time, if the time falls into within this range, use this label for that. So that's really the extent of this. And there are other ways to do even more powerful stuff, um, you know, and, and add more code to it. But that's that's for another conversation right now. But just to understand that you can build powerful dashboard tools using this. All right, so we finally arrived to the end of this conversation. I really thank you for being here. Uh, just remember that a data engineering process involves not just coding, but involves a lot of other areas, uh, DevOps, cloud engineering, operation support, data governance, a lot of things, right? So we have to, when we start building a, a, a data engineering project, we need to think about all those areas, not just how we're gonna code it, right? <clears throat> so all these tools that you see here are very useful um, and you don't have to use exactly those tools, but it's just the approach, the understanding that those tools are there, are available to you. Please continue to follow the GitHub project and it's gonna continue to grow. Um, I'm going to be building out more data streaming concepts, uh, real-time data integration, and things like that. And also visit my blog. Uh, in my blog, I actually um, put a lot more detail. I actually add and document uh, more of the background story behind some of these concepts. Um, so um, take a look at that, read it if you want. It really, it really provides a lot more information about um, the different areas of the process, right? So <clears throat> it actually gives you a lot more information and exercises, right? So it really covers a lot of background and a lot of concepts uh, where we can actually look at um, other areas um, so for example, if you look at data analysis and visualization that I, I cover a little bit, now this gives you a lot more background. It goes deeper into the concepts. So just keep keep reading it. I uh, continue to add more data here. So you are more than welcome to please um, follow that, uh, follow the GitHub project, give me a start if you like it. And I really wanna thank you for spending the time with me. And I hope, I hope uh, my presentation has has been useful, it gives you some concepts, some ideas, uh, and, and it's something that you enjoy. You guys take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.